All right, we're going to go ahead and open up our webinar today, and I want to say welcome uh, to today's session. We're going to be moving forward with a workshop on adaptive mountain biking, successfully serving mountain bikers with disabilities as part of our Oregon Outdoor Recreation Summit. We're thankful to list all of our summit sponsors and today's speakers for making today's session possible. So thanks to all of our sponsors and, and all of you, our panelists today. My name is Michelle Emmons McFarland. I'm a founding member and volunteer of the Alpine Trail Crew Association. And we work with the Forest Service in the Middle Fork Ranger District here in the Willamette National Forest. Uh, nonprofit trail stu stewardship organization. We're dedicated to providing sustainable, equitable access to our public lands on trails. And we're super excited to be moderating today's program. Uh, so moving forward, I um, also, well, before we get started here, we're going to talk a little bit about housekeeping. Um, our Oregon Trails Coalition Director, Steph Noll, will be providing technical support. So if you have technical questions related to using Zoom, you can use the chat feature and you'll find that in your control bar at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, feel free to ask Steph any questions. Uh, today's panelists will also love for attendees to introduce themselves in the chat. Uh, so let us know who you are and where you work and who you work with. As an attendee, you can virtually raise your hand. You can submit questions in Q&A. Um, so use the chat again if you have technical questions and then submit your questions for our Q&A session in the Q&A uh, function at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can also submit questions anytime during the presentation. Uh, in the Q&A function, and we'll try to get to those as we go along. Otherwise, we can answer those at the end of the session, um, first come, first serve. This webinar is being recorded, and we expect to make recordings available on the Travel Oregon YouTube channel uh, later this fall. Summit hosts will send out the recording links to all Summit participants as soon as they are available. This workshop today is presented by Oregon Adaptive Sports, a nonprofit based in Bend. And this Oregon Adaptive Sports is the leading provider of adaptive mountain biking experiences for individuals with disabilities in the Pacific Northwest. This workshop will provide critical information on trail design and selection, adaptive mountain biking equipment, and the key partnerships that allow individuals with disabilities to successfully will learn about best practices and trail design to accommodate adaptive mountain bikes, what kind of adaptive equipment is used, and the critical partnerships to ensure individuals with disabilities feel welcome on their trail network. So moving forward, our presenters, first off, I will introduce Pat Adabo, the Executive Director at Oregon Adaptive Sports, which provides year-round outdoor adaptive sports experiences for individuals with disabilities, including mountain biking, which we'll learn a little bit more about this afternoon. Pat has been working in adaptive mountain biking for over a decade, specializing in instruction and introducing athletes new to the sport, along with advocacy and outreach to relevant agencies, continuing to increase access and opportunity for people with disabilities. We also have Jake O'Connor joining us. He's the founder and owner of Reactive Adaptations, one of the United States leading manufacturers of off-road hand cycles and recumbent trikes. Jake founded Reactive Adaptations from the growing need for access to the outdoors. And uh, yes, we also have Ashley Schaefer, a disability advocate, consultant, and designer focused on changing perceptions and moving beyond ADA for more inclusive and welcoming environments. So without further ado, let's get this party started and I'm gonna hand the mic off to Pat. Awesome, thanks Michelle and welcome everybody. I'm gonna pull up our presentation here. Give me just one second. So hopefully everybody can see that. Uh, and yeah, thanks again for having us. And I, I wanna especially thank Ashley and Jake for joining us. Jake and I have known each other for about 10 years and uh, we're fortunate to have him with us here. Jake is often in his shop building bikes. And so it's great to have him uh, here in front of such a, a diverse audience of people around the state of Oregon making a difference in trails and access. And then Ashley as well, who's a volunteer athlete uh, 
and local friend and community member here in Bend, where OAS is based. So thanks again uh, for joining us. Um, what we're going to talk about today, Michelle hit on it. Uh, we're going to give a pretty high level introduction to what adaptive mountain biking is, at least in the context of what we're presenting on today. Uh, talk about equipment, some keys to trail design and selection, and again, all the, the partnerships and organizations that make it all work. Uh, just to see some of us out in action, you can see Jake there pedaling in his own backyard in Crested Butte, Colorado, Ashley down riding in Yosemite uh, and with some friends here locally. And this is me and a friend, uh, Topher, who came out from Colorado to come riding out here not too long ago. So overview of adaptive mountain biking, what is it that we're actually talking about here? And you could consider adaptive mountain biking being this extremely broad uh, sports. Uh, what we're talking about today is really the physical adaptation to mountain biking. So some of the populations of individuals that you may see participating in this context of adaptive mountain biking would be those with spinal cord injuries or, or some form of paralysis, uh, somebody that survived a stroke, traumatic brain injury, multiple sclerosis, muscular dystrophy, amputees. Uh, but please, as you're developing your own access or, or tools or resources, you know, don't forget to consider that there are many people of many different abilities that are mountain bikers. At OAS, we serve kids, adults, uh, we serve folks with cognitive disabilities, um, many of whom don't need any real adaptation to the, the physical side of mountain biking, again, that we're focusing on today. But some of the trail design and communication that we will talk about may be uh, appropriate to consider when including those individuals. So again, in context, what is adaptive mountain biking? What does it all encompass? Uh, it's just as wide ranging as non-adaptive mountain biking. So here are three pictures of folks taking the sport to different levels or, or different extremes. You could say that the far left is somebody riding a downhill oriented adaptive mountain bike, clearly at speed with significant error there. In the middle is Jake actually fly fishing from his adaptive mountain bike. These, tool, these bikes are really great tools for access in addition to uh, riding mountain bike trails and getting that mountain bike like experience. Uh, and on the right there is Ashley taking her dog for a walk. It looks like maybe the dog had already got enough exercise and was just going for a ride at that point. But this sport opens up a lot of great possibilities uh, for folks. And that's why we are so passionate about it here at OAS. Again, narrowing the conversation just a little bit and talking about equipment. So there are many types of mobility devices that allow individuals to get off road or get off paved trails, paved paths. Uh, if you look on the left of your screen here, you'll see uh, the Freedom Chair it is a, a pretty cool piece of equipment. It, it's an adaptive hiking wheelchair, you could say, an off-road wheelchair. Uh, and on the far right, you see the thing with tank treads is uh, an action tracker, uh, basically tank chair. Uh, or, and those two kind of extremes are, are not what we're talking about today. There are many things within the scope of that realm um, off-road devices that allow folks uh, with disabilities to get off-road out of their everyday chairs or other kind of everyday mobility devices and out into nature. What we are focusing on is more in the middle here, uh, which are adaptive mountain bikes. These are uh, pieces of equipment that are built, designed to create a mountain bike experience or to create those specific tools of access like we just showed. So within adaptive mountain biking equipment, there also are several types of equipment that you could break the sport further down into. And we're going to do a little bit of that today. Uh, we have off-road hand cycles. So the left hand picture here, you see an individual and there's pedals uh, with his hands and hand cranks. Uh, this is very similar to road hand cycling. You may be more familiar with this. In the middle, you see an off-road recumbent cycle with actually fat tires riding on snow. Great for an individual uh, again with a traumatic brain injury or balance impairment, but still want to ride uh, with a leg powered device. And on the far right, you see a picture of just an adaptation to a traditional mountain bike. This is a, an army veteran actually riding who has a bilateral below elbow uh, bilateral, excuse me, below elbow amputations. Um, and if you look closer there, you can see how his handlebars are adapted and he has a very specially designed butt brake that he uses behind the seat there. Um, again, what we are focusing on today are, are the left hand and middle pictures. Uh, 
Matt over here on the right, that's mountain biking, doesn't really need any specific adaptations or consideration when it comes specifically to trails compared to three or four wheel devices. So within the realm that we are focusing on, uh, front wheel, off-road, or off-road hand cycles and recumbent hand cycles, we have a few different categories of those. We have front wheel drive off-road hand cycles, we have rear wheel drive, rear wheel drive off-road hand cycles, and we have those off-road recumbent cycles nearly all of which are gonna be rear wheel drive. Um, in the adaptive sports world, we refer to front wheel drive uh, cycles as Delta style, which basically means if you see here, the front, uh, the two wheels are in the back versus one wheel in the front. Uh, the similarity to these for many users is they're often very similar, or the pros are they're often very similar to road hand cycles, a piece of equipment somebody may be more familiar with. Uh, there can be some simplicity with the controls uh, and some overall kind of ease of use uh, compared to some rear wheel drive hand cycles. Rear wheel drive, uh, we often refer to as tadpole style. If you see pictures here, you can see how the two wheels are in the front with the one drive wheel in the back uh, resembling a tadpole. Uh, Tadpole style off-road hand cycles are some things that Jake makes. Jake makes a few different styles and he can elaborate a little bit on those. Um, there are a few different manufacturers out there, uh, both here in the United States and abroad. Uh, so specific pros and advantages to these types of bikes are the improved traction by having the drive wheel in the back. Uh, when you start going uphill, you're gonna get much better traction. Generally, these bikes are a little bit more capable on technical trails, rocks, roots, logs, uh, features. And they also generally give you that mountain bike feel is something that we often hear reported when you're riding a, a tadpole bike versus the Delta style or front wheel drive bike. And then of course the off-road recumbent cycles. So uh, many of you probably have seen off-road or recumbent cycles out just on bike trails. Off-road bikes just take those bikes to the next level in terms of fat tires, suspension, uh, mountain bike components, drivetrains, things like that to allow riders to get further off-road. There are other types of, uh, of adaptive mountain bikes uh, that are three or four wheeled that we are not gonna talk about today. Those would be gravity focused or motor assist only, bikes that don't have any pedals of any sort. So just a visual representation of what we just mentioned. Again, front wheel drive, one wheel in the front, that Delta style, you can see on the left there, the shifters are attached to the hand grips, uh, simplicity in, in design and control, rear wheel drive, drive wheel on the back, different types. The bike on the right is one of Jake's bikes called the Nuke uh, versus the left. You can see the rider in this kneeling or prone position. Off-road recumbents, they do come in all shapes and sizes as well from big fat tires to, to more gravel grinding type. And then bikes, again, that we're not really talking about today, which are these gravity powered, where there's no pedals and you're really just relying on a chairlift or vehicle shuttle to get down the hill, or something that's completely motor driven, uh, like the bike on the right. Modifications, just like you see modifications to other traditional mountain bikes, the same can be applied to adaptive mountain bikes. And this bike pictured here actually has all three of these. So electric assist is a big one that it has um, become very popular across all types of mountain bikes and we know is an increasingly controversial uh, topic when it comes to access and accessibility. Um, but electric assist is, is extremely favored by many off-road hand cyclists and recumbent cyclists due to the uh, equalization and access that it provides. Suspension, uh, these bikes can be high-end, high-built, complicated linkages. Uh, and Jay can chime in on that if he wants to when I wrap up here. And then fat tires, uh, so winter biking, and uh, is something that we are trying to get a little bit more into here at Bend. And I think I think I saw Gary chimed in from Coda, and he emailed me yesterday too. Uh, looking forward to chatting more with you about that opportunity uh, this winter. Some specifications. This is a question we often get: of how big are these bikes? Uh, this is relevant for a storage. You know, that's a big part of what we deal with here. Uh, for individuals that are transporting them and also access when it comes to the trails themselves. So these are samples from our warehouse here at Oregon Adaptive Sports. Uh, these are four different bikes that we have and you can see the variations in size and width 
uh, the longest being eight feet long. The length I measured as the, the farthest point at either the end of each tire uh, or the cranks in the case of the uh, ice full fat or the leg trays in the case of the nuke. Um, so eight feet long is the, the longest with the lasher. The wheelbases all range from four to five and a half feet that I measured from where the tires are touching the ground. And then the width is the widest point of the bikes, which is generally the tires. Uh, so either the two in the back or two in the front or in the case of the nuke, uh, which is this bottom right type of bike here, the hand grips uh, can stick out wider than the tires. Uh, some of these things are adjustable, uh, but this gives you a rough framework to understand how big these bikes are and uh, the space that they need to be stored and on the trails uh, when it comes to design. So we, those are the different types of bikes. I want to turn it over to Jake here to talk a little bit about what these bikes actually get on the trail, what we're looking for, the different types of trails that they can ride, uh, and some of the keys that, that make it or break it for these types of bikes. And Jake, I think you'll need to unmute yourself uh, before you start talking here. So. Try it, try it one more time. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Hey, thanks for having me, Pat. And that was a really good description of all the different types of hand cycles that are out there. And I appreciate you guys having me. Um, once again, my name is Jake O'Connor. I live in Crested Butte, Colorado. I own a company called Reactive Adaptations. I've been building the hand cycles for about 10 years now. Um, I don't really have a script to go off of here, so I'm just going to talk aloud and Pat can yell at me and tell me what he wants me to say, because that would be appreciated. Um, I've, like I said, I've been riding these types of bikes for about 17 years now. I am in a wheelchair, been paralyzed from the waist down for about 19 years, so I've got a pretty good amount of experience with riding these things on just about every type of terrain out there. Um, I've been trying to put together uh, a guide to trail building for quite a few years now, and, and uh, I'm trying to get real serious with producing a document. And in that document, I've tried to narrow down the types of main trails that I feel are the main trails. And so that's what Pat's brought up here is the, the five main trails that I think are relevant. And that is one, the paved type of recreational path or, or um, like a rail trail, something that's basically used to be an old railroad flat or a paved trail or a road. And it's flat, it doesn't have a lot of camber from side to side. Um, it's basically the easiest of all trails. It could probably be ridden by any type of a device, including a road bike, a road hand cycle, whatever. Um, and then it gets progressively more difficult in my rating here. Um, like the second one, dirt, maintained forest road. All this is pretty self-explanatory. Um, this would be something that's regularly maintained by some sort of, I guess, municipality, uh, a regular dirt road. Um, yeah. The next one down, unmaintained forest road, which is uh, kind of something that's um, the most popular for basically all these hand cycles. I know, uh, like for instance, up in Montana, they've got millions of miles of old forest roads that, and logging roads that have been uh, uh, basically shut down by the Forest Service, but are still rideable. And so this is sort of a, a favorite of a lot of my customers up in Montana and Idaho and, and so on. Um, the next one now would be double track, Jeep trails, um, OHV trails, you know, four by four trails, nasty trails, obviously they're not maintained by anybody. Um, they can be washed out. They can be uh, really easy to access. Um, it could be a whole range of, of difficulty in this category right here. Um, but these are also very popular with uh, my customers because most of the time they're fairly wide. Um, a lot of the obstacles are kind of removed because the OHVs have done a good job of kind of removing some of the larger obstacles, I guess you could say. Um, so this is a really popular category, I think, for, for most of my customers. And then the last but not least is single track. Um, this would be anything that's generally, you know, 
in my opinion, eight inches wide all the way up to two feet wide. Um, generally speaking, they're probably about 18 inches wide. Um, and this is my favorite type of thing, but this is the most difficult category. Uh, most of the trails up here in Crested Butte seem to be in the uh, 18 or inches or lesser range. So I've had to adapt these bikes to try and fit those trails the best we can. And um, yeah, uh, as our technology seems to be getting better and better every year, uh, more and more of my customers are finding themselves on these single track type trails. Uh, whether that's good or bad, I don't know. But uh, that's kind of what we're looking at. Um, and then to continue on with my speech about trying to figure out how to define how to build a trail, I've come up with the three major attributes that I feel are the three major ones. There's, there's obviously a lot more um, to do with trails than just these three, but these seem to be the biggest ones that contribute to problems that we have when riding any type of the trails that were in the previous slide. So number one is camber. This is our number one, um, I, I don't have a good way of saying it without being negative, but this is the one that gets us in trouble the most, uh, especially with the trikes, is that what we call off uh, camber or side hilling is what causes us to tip over and crash. And as you can see, um, definitely my buddy on the with the right bike there he actually fell off the trail luckily he can sort of walk crawl and so he took a picture of this for us to show us what his trails around Flagstaff kind of look like and this is pretty typical uh, for a lot of the trails around Crested Butte and basically everywhere um, as you can see that trail is probably about 18 inches wide was not purpose-built for off-road hand cycle and uh, in most cases, this would topple most hand cycle riders, this angle right here. Um, and so, like I said, the camber, the side hilling, this is our number one uh, enemy. Um, pitch and grade and obstacles. This is a, this was tough for me to decide which one is, uh, you know, worse. Um, these bikes, at least the bikes that I build have in a tremendous amount of gearing, uh, we can climb up almost anything. We can actually climb better than most able-bodied riders because we don't have to unclip and put a foot down in case we tip. Uh, the three wheels keep us stable. And so we're, with the addition of motors and uh, what we call mountain drives and all the new drivetrains that are coming out these days uh, with incredible gear ratios and all that good stuff, we're able to climb virtually everything that able-bodied mountain bikers can. Uh, but that being said, some of the front wheel drive, off-road hand cycles struggle a little bit with this type of terrain. Uh, front wheel drive uh, generally tends to, I guess you could say fail after about eight, you know, six, seven, eight percent grades, they, the, the front wheel starts to break loose a little bit and the, uh, the rider tends to struggle a little bit to get up the hill. Um, so anyway, back to the attributes, you know, um, pitch grade is, is a problem for us, even with the rear wheel drive bikes, um, but probably less of a problem than the camber. And then the last but not least is obstacles. Um, this is pretty self-explanatory. I mean, most of these bikes that are out there are 32 inches wide. 33 inches, 34, 35 inches wide. And so I know uh, a lot of the bridges that were built out in Crested Butte at one point were not wide enough for me to get across. So since we've tried to go back and widen some of those, um, a lot of the rollovers, like in the picture on the right, uh, we've had to make sure that those are wide enough for my bikes and other manufacturers' bikes. Um, but uh, definitely obstacles are one of the biggest challenges on the trails for us. Uh, man-made or not, for sure. Do you want me to touch on this part, Jake? Yes, please. Okay, thanks for uh, for uh, covering that portion. And you know, we talked a little bit 
just hear in a minute about planning and inclusion. Uh, we experienced that when I was living back in Crested Butte, you know, with trail design. It's much easier to plan the trail ahead of time uh, with the right voices in mind than to go back and adapt it later. Um, but one of the biggest barriers that we hear and uh, experience even as a program for off-road hand cyclists or off-road recumbent cyclists is just the lack of information. And that's what we're hoping to accomplish today is by learning a little bit more about the different types of bikes that exist and these common uh, attributes that are really critical to access uh, to help those of you that are land managers or involved in other types of uh, promotion of mountain biking to know a little bit better about what information you can provide to this population. Uh, but very simply put, one of the biggest barriers to access is the lack of available information. Uh, so by making an intentional effort to communicate this, uh, you can do a lot to remove these barriers. Often folks are surprised at the capability of uh, adaptive mountain bikes, the equipment, uh, and the riders themselves, uh, that not much, if anything, has to be changed. Um, but adaptive mountain bikers need to know before they go out, you know, am I going to be able to complete this loop? Uh, am I going to get into a situation where I have to have assistance from somebody uh, on a traditional mountain bike. Um, and it's much easier to know that ahead of time than to figure it out on the fly. Uh, so some suggestions that we have uh, when describing trails are to first talk about the general facilities that somebody may encounter. You know, is it a trailhead? Are there accessible parking spaces? What are the bathrooms like? Um, are the picnic areas accessible? Um, giving a general sense of the the trail network or trail itself? Is it high desert riding? Is it alpine? Is it dense forest riding? Um, what user types may be out there? Are you going to encounter equestrian riders, uh, other mountain bikers? Are there one directional trails? Things like that. And then keeping adaptive mountain bikes in mind, talking specific to mileage uh, to specific trails. There may be a trail network like we have here in Bend, the Phil's Trail Network. Uh, where the vast majority of that trail network is rideable by adaptive mountain bikes, uh, but there are certain trails that are not. So you could uh, highlight specifically which ones are or are not. And then when you get into the specific trails that are accessible to adaptive mountain bikes, talking about those three attributes that Jake described, the camber, the pitch, and the obstacles. Uh, and the one thing I wanted to add to the pitch conversation is overall elevation gain is obviously very different than just the in you know, the instance of one steep uphill or something like that. Uh, this picture that we featured here, you can see uh, this rider is actually successfully riding up this very steep pitch thanks to this trail surface, you know, high friction, high traction rock. Uh, if this was the loose, dusty soil here in Bend, he probably would not be successfully riding up this. Um, but if the overall trail only gains 500 feet over a couple of miles, uh, but there's just one part where it gains 20 feet and uh, 20 feet, then you could have a problem. Uh, so by covering these areas, uh, you can really create uh, a lot more access and provide a lot more information and remove that big barrier uh, that exists. A couple of success stories that we wanted to just touch on. Uh, one is one that Jake helped to spearhead and, and I think speaks to uh, this process of planning and uh, making it all work. Uh, so there's a trail in Crested Butte called the Lupin 2 Trail. And this is, uh, Jake, do you remember how long the trail is? It's only a mile or two. It's not very long. A couple mile trail close to town. These pictures are both of that trail. Um, but it took several agencies involved to, uh, to make this come together. So first and foremost were the riders themselves, you know, the local athletes, Jake being that, that critical voice, local nonprofit, there called the Adaptive Sports Center, very similar to Oregon Adaptive Sports, the local trail advocacy group, uh, the town, the land trust, the BLM, those folks that are in charge of those uh, actual land easements and access, you know, all of those folks came together uh, to purpose build a trail that was able to accommodate uh, off-road and adaptive mountain bikes, um, as well as create a really great user experience for every type of rider. One key component that, that came out of that was simply expanding the width of the trail during construction to roughly that four foot wide uh, mark that you often see when trails are machine built by trail dozers and things like that. Uh, this allows for barrier free riding for the adaptive mountain bikes 
Uh, it also allowed for increased uh, or decreased user conflicts. So if a trail runner was coming up upon a mountain biker, there was more room for those folks to get by each other. Um, and then over the course of a couple of years, that trail really grew back into what looks like more uh, natural foot and a half wide single track, but ultimately resulted in uh, a really universal riding experience. And fortunately, we're having similar success here in Bend and Central Oregon. Uh, we haven't specifically designed a, an actual trail, but all the folks at Central Oregon Trail Alliance, I know there's a few on this uh, webinar right now, have been very supportive and communicating with Oregon Adaptive Sports. We have a number of local riders, Ashley's one of them, uh, that are out riding these trails on a regular basis and often providing us as an organization critical information on trails that we uh, are great for these bikes or not, or things that can be worked on. And then consistent communication with the Forest Service uh, and the BLM, the, you know, the two key land management agencies that are here. Uh, so part of that, you know, it all reflects uh, key steps of the inclusive planning process. I wanna turn over to Ashley to, to speak about this um, as we continue to advocate for access. Hey, thanks. I'm Ashley Schaefer. I do advocacy and consulting for accessibility. I have a background in architecture, so I'm really into the way we design the built environment and the outdoor is included in that since we do design these trails. Um, and really what we're talking about here is inclusion. You know, this is thinking about design differently in ways that will make things better for everyone. Um, you know, and, and a lot with land managers and people who are in charge of these things, um, a lot of times people get stuck on ADA. And that's one of the things that I've been working on a lot lately. Um, Coming Suit is a land manager's toolkit for accessibility. Um, look for that in your inboxes soon. Um, but it really, ADA, you know, is so narrow in, you know, has all these regulations and boxes to check and it doesn't address things like these, you know, big rock features or these narrow bridges and the trail width and everything. Um, it really talks about a quarter of a mile paved trail and, you know, the people we're talking about today don't want that. Um, and so really getting into, there's a, a big diversity within disability also, you know, as we talked about all the different types of injuries that would typically use these bikes, there's, you know, an even broader, you know, world of people with disabilities that want to get outside and we don't just want a bathroom and a, a paved trail all the time, which is useful. Um, but it's not everything. And so really trying to expand your lens, you know, work on educating yourself and your organization um, to, to think about this differently. And that's kind of the point of this presentation is to show you the, you know, different abilities, the different types of bikes, the things that we need, because you don't know. So we, we have to tell you and you have to ask. That's a big part of it is, you know, talking with people, engaging the community. This is part of it. Um, you know, other ways to, to get involved with people is forming committees, um, hiring consultants, and really seeking lived experience. You know, that's why Jake and I are both on this today is because I have also been in a wheelchair for almost 19 years. Um, and it's, it's really important to get that, that lived experience from people, um, you know, because if you're going about things and you're telling people that it's inclusive and everything and you've done all this work, well, the people that have actually, you know, lived it will know that you didn't really do your research. And so it's super important. And, you know, a lot of times you won't be serving people very well if you don't actually seek out help from people who've, who've lived it. Um, you know, and that also touches on, you know, paying people for their time. That's a big thing right now with, you know, all of the DEI work that, that people are being asked to do. It's very important because this, this labor comes at a heavy cost for, for a lot of us. Um, and so when you're working on your education and all of the things to expand your lens, make sure you're, you're valuing people's time. Um, but also, uh, Another thing on that is never assuming. That's that's kind of that goes along with you know all of those is is that when you're you're designing something, don't assume just because you've seen this presentation, for example, that you know what the right you know trail is going to be or how to handle a certain feature. Um, it really is important for you to to ask people you know whether that's with OAS or someone you know in the community um, hiring a consultant. You just you never know, um, and so you want to double check. 
So, and then another thing we talked about earlier was, you know, the access to information. That's huge. Um, Pat talked a lot about that, but kind of background on why I think mean, people with disabilities, uh, you know, have a really hard time going places without knowing where they're going in general, not just for trails. Um, you know, one of the biggest tools that I used and have used for, you know, the whole 19 years is, well, I guess not 19 years, but Google Street View, um, you know, it's, it's huge because, you know, you have no idea what's going to be accessible. ADA only applies to certain things of certain ages and, and all of that. And so you don't know if you're going to a business and whether or not that's going to be accessible. And so people rely heavily on that kind of information. And, you know, it brings a lot of comfort and makes things easier. And so it's kind of a similar concept with this, you know, we, we need to know more specifics about the trails. Um, you know, I've worked with state parks trying to, to help them add some more accessibility to their website and, you know, documenting things and describing things. If you can put stuff on your website, images of stuff like this rock feature that, that you saw of, you know, someone who's having a hard time getting through it. If you had a picture of that describing where it was in the trail or something, that would be huge. Because like in Bend, we have a lot of trails that are great that I really love, but there is this one part near the end that is like almost impassable and you need help to get through it or you have to go off trail, you know, things that aren't great. Um, so the trail is almost there, but there's one little thing that hangs you up and that sucks. Um, and so if we, we knew that ahead of time, we could deal with that appropriately. Um, and so it's just as many possible, as many photos as possible, um, as much description as you can give as possible. All of those, those things that, that Jake talked about are, are pretty important and anything you can give honestly at this point is helpful, but really like go for the gold and, and try to get all of those things. Um, and then, you know, another big part of welcoming people and inviting people, because within disability, the invite, if we, you know, see a trail and it, it says something like, you know, no motorized or something, which is another topic to get into, the e-assist, how it's pretty important for people on, you know, adapted bikes. Not everyone. For me, it definitely is. I went on a trail along the, the riverfront in Bend the other day, and I can't get up one of the trails near the golf course course without it. Um, and that's just an in-town trail, like, you know, walking trail. Um, I can't get up the mountain bike trails without my e-assist. And so that's super important to, you know, to have information that, you know, is accurate and inviting and not, you know, have stuff that really excludes people and make sure you're, you're talking to that well. Um, so marketing, it, you know, showing in your media and everything people who are also you know with disabilities and have adapted gear is super important to making people feel welcome um you know it doesn't have to be something that is specifically about you know disability or you know about an event about disability just include it in everyday marketing you know it, does, it can be in the background it doesn't matter it you know we're, we're working to normalize these things and it's not normal if it's something that's like highlight with a big star behind you know and everything which goes into inspiration porn i would like to challenge all of you to google that no it's not going to bring up anything dirty if you just search inspiration porn, it will explain to you this is your start of education and taking it into your own hands. Um, but we're not here to inspire people. We're here to just go out and get rad on the trail. Um, you know, and so really that it just needs to be normalized and you need to, to make those efforts within your marketing and avoid tokenism, which is that, you know, big sparkly view of someone who is in a wheelchair to show that you're, you're inclusive. That, that's not inclusion. That's tokenism. Um, so yeah, you know, just use real people from your community. Like I did a photo shoot with OAS for, for 10 barrel. They were working on some stock photos on a, a thing they were doing and they had people from the community. They, they contacted OAS and OAS knew people. And so everyone got involved and did it. And it was super fun and, you know, built community. It was great networking and, you know, that's really the way to do it is to reach out to your local organizations like OAS who are already doing the work or already connected with the people in the community that you're trying to target. Um, so I really, that's, that's probably the biggest thing is reaching out to people and educating yourself and engaging the community. Thanks. Thanks, Ashley, so much. And uh, just as a reminder, we're gonna transition here to uh, some time for question and answer. 
uh, please submit your Q&A through the Q&A function or, or drop it in the chat. Um, so I'll pull up this uh, last slide here really quickly uh, with just some act or excuse me, contact information. Again, this is all going to be recorded and, and released later, just so you know how to get in contact with uh, any of the three of us. Uh, and then I'm actually going to stop my screen share and help turn us back over to Michelle to help facilitate a Q and A. Um, I did see one question that came up as Michelle's coming back online about the equipment. Um, so I thought I would first ask Jake if he could just kind of give a little overview of the cost range of his bikes and how his customers uh, tend to afford those. Um, and then we can talk a little bit about how OIS also provides access to these pieces of equipment. Right. Um, my typical piece of equipment starts at about $7,400. That would be for the bomber and it goes up from there. I've got about six different types of products that I produce now. And the more doodads you add, the higher the price that goes up. Typically, uh, I would say an average build for me right now with electric assist and with quad brakes and quad adaptions and all the bells and whistles, the Cadillac of all the bikes that I build is somewhere around eleven to $12,000 right now. And, and how are you seeing your customers generally uh, afford <clears throat> to purchase those as individuals? Pat, it kind of varies, to be honest with you. I have a lot of individuals that afford it themselves. We do go through some insurance companies, but more often than not, there's a lot of not-for-profits out there that are basically just giving money away to buy bikes, which is really awesome. Some of the big ones are Kelly Brush Foundation, uh, Challenged Athletes Foundation, High Fives Foundation, and then a lot of my builds uh, go through the VA. So the government uh, is buying these for veterans that have some sort of disability. So that's pretty cool too. Yeah, and, and where OAS, Oregon Adaptive Sports, falls into that is, is we also uh, secure grants to purchase them as programs and we provide uh, access to these bikes either free or, or at very low cost. Uh, this summer, for example, we've been providing free mountain bike experiences uh, for individuals with disabilities all summer long. So. Uh, cost is one of those big barriers to outdoor recreation for any individual and especially individuals with disabilities. And when you talk about seven to $15,000 mountain bikes, that's obviously a huge cost. Um, so there are organizations that are out there. We have a blog post actually on our website uh, with some recent information on funding sources. OAS actually has a small grant program that we just started offering as well for Oregonians with disabilities. Uh, so trying to bring that barrier down, uh, but it, it certainly exists. Um, so I'm not sure, Michelle, are you uh, back with us to uh, yes. us the rest I'm, of the Q&A here? Excellent. All right. I am back with us. Um, perhaps I should start my video. <laughs> um, so we did have another question that came up in the chat box um, around asking why are we avoiding asking for free labor? Many trails are built by volunteers. Um, when you're asking for more DEI type work around design or inclusion, um, community engagement and volunteer trail building events that you ask everyone to do are great, but if you wouldn't ask the regular user for this work for free, it's crossing a line. So maybe I think the question here is why wouldn't you ask people in adaptive situations to help build the trails that they use? And I, sorry for not clarifying, you absolutely would. If it's something that you would ask anyone else to help on a regular trail, that's totally cool. But if it is something that is extra, if you're just trying to understand, you know, what, what inclusion is or, you know, inspiration porn or, you know, those things. If you're coming for, for information on, on all of this stuff, who to get contact connected with and everything. Um, if it's outside of what you would ask anybody to do, then it does, does cross a line. It's a little different. Um, people with disabilities also love to do trail events and everything. I mean, we've done like OAS. I, I've personally been involved in like spring thing at, at Smith Rock where we went and made the trail more accessible and the, the climbing area better and everything. And so that stuff, no, it's absolutely, it's fine. You just got to be careful on, you know, if you're asking different questions than you would ask other people, you need to consider why you're doing that. 
There was also a question about um, whether or not there's a catalog of trails and locations for adaptive mountain bikers in Oregon. Um, if there was anything official that was out there that, that people with disabilities could connect with. Specific to adaptive mountain biking, I don't believe that there is. We are starting to compile more information here through Oregon Adaptive Sports. Um, there are many uh, user type uh, forums out there, and Jake could speak a little bit to this. There is a website that exists that has some information about very specific rides. I don't think any in Oregon. Um, and then there are many like Facebook groups and things like that. One is the ORHC group. Uh, which many individuals are on that. Um, but it's a need for sure. Um, one thing we've started here at OAS, we started with uh, accessible trails, not specific to uh, mountain biking, but more geared towards hiking types experiences. So we actually have a series of about seven or eight of those that are available online and we will be pivoting towards mountain biking um, next season, basically next spring. Um, but it's a slow process for sure. I don't know if you have anything to add to that comment, Jake. Um, not really. Um, we, we attempted a website called adaptivetrails.com. It's still up and running. It's at about 25%. Um, we had about 50 or 60 trail reviews. We came up with a rating guide, um, similar to like, uh, trail forks or mountain bike project. And it was going pretty smoothly, but we've since kind of run into funding problems. Um, it's, it's hard to keep a site up and running that's as complex as that one was. And so we've sort of shut it down temporarily till we can figure out how we can fund that. Um, but that, that was our attempt and we're still trying. Just as an aside, I'm wondering if MTB Project and Trail Forks uh, might be open to adding a feedback segment on their sites that anyone can go to. And if I have a friend who has an adaptive need, I can go there and get information knowing that they can give me up to date feedback on whether that trail is appropriate for my friend to join me on. Um, uh, trail Forks is, Trail Forks has the ability to post um, trails and basically say that it, it, it is uh, good for adaptive or not good for adaptive. They are working with another individual um, uh, on expanding their, I guess, website to include adaptive trails. I, I don't know anything about that, um, but we've, we've talked with them and I don't know if Mountain Bike Project has been approached or not. They are, um, they are not, they've been a little bit resistant. So uh, we've sort of stopped asking them for favors. Maybe some peer pressure from everybody would help out with that. <laughs> we, <Exactly>. do have a, <laughs> we have a couple more questions. Um, so Cody Jeffers asked, with e-bikes becoming more popular and infamous at the same time, how do you suggest land managers and rule enforcers to handle blocking non-adaptive based e-bikes versus allowing adapted e-bikes with electronic components? What are the key terms that differentiate an e-bike from an adaptive bike with electric components? Yeah, this is a, a very a big question right now. And one thing I will, I will plug is I, I believe the Forest Service nationally is accepting comments right now on their e-bike policies. And so we're hoping that as uh, these policies are continued to develop that there are uh, specific definitions that uh, really increase access for people with disabilities and help to, to regulate access as a whole for e-bikes. Um, I think what we learned today, you know, very often the bikes uh, that you see for folks with uh, disabilities that really impact their ability to participate in mountain biking in a traditional sense are going to be more than two wheels. Uh, so I would say that that's one clear uh, distinction that you could make uh, that three or, or sometimes there are a few four wheel type hand cycle offered uh, recumbents out there. Um, those are gonna be being used by an individual with a disability. Um, but I would say that the key here is communication and collaboration between uh, organizations like OIS, individuals with disabilities and the land management agencies in trying to figure out those uh, solutions. 
I don't think that there is a, a totally perfect answer other than we certainly are advocating for continued access for those riders with disabilities, uh, but certainly understand the greater issue of e-bikes and uh, the impact or, or the lack of understanding of impact on the trails and things that, just, that we just don't know yet. So. Maybe I should chime in, Pat. Please. <laughs> As a manufacturer, I can tell you that maybe eight out of, or nine of every 10 of the bikes that I'm building has got some form of e-assist on it. Um, it's hugely popular with the adaptive world. Without it, um, we wouldn't be doing the same trails as able-bodied riders. I've been pretty resistant to it, um, just because I think I'm manly enough to, to pedal most of these trails without e-assist, but my wife finally told me the other day, five years ago, giddy assist on your bike because I wasn't able to do the same trails that Pat was doing and that she was doing there. Most of the trails start five miles out of town here in Crested Butte. And by the time I got to those trails, I was gassed. And so I was missing out on a lot of cool stuff. And since I've been putting e assist on my own personal bikes, I've been riding the same trails as my wife, almost as fast as my wife. I'll never be able to do single track as fast as Pat or my wife, but I can at least get to those trailheads at the same speed. I can go up the roads at the same speed that they can, and I can do 20 mile rides instead of five mile rides now. So it is awesome. It is great equalizer and uh, it's out there, you know, and, and I'm installing it on nine out of every 10 of the bikes I build now. I, I and I'm seeing a few other questions come in, so maybe we'll get to them specifically. You know, one thing I do want to keep in mind is, as we always are advocating for increased accessibility, um, e-bikes are, it's a much bigger issue than just accessibility and disability. Um, and in the grand scheme of things, uh, if you think about, you know, from the small example here in, in Bend, uh, Phil's trailhead, any given day of, any decent riding weather day of the week, if you go to Phil's, there's hundreds if not you know a thousand folks going out to ride a mountain bike and there may be one uh adaptive mountain biker that heads out in that group uh certainly we hope to see that number continue to rise but we're still talking about a very small percentage so those of you that are land managers um, that's where we are really excited to be a part of that conversation and help to develop those policies um, and hopefully come to the best solution possible but the e-bike popularity is likely only going to continue to rise, not just among individuals with disabilities, but across the board. So it's clearly a, an, an issue in the mountain biking industry as a whole that, that needs to be addressed. Thanks for that, Pat. I think that answers Reed Brown's question as well about debate on electric assist in the adaptive sports market. So appreciate that. Um, there's another question here. It's asking if there's other industry or rider trends that trail builders should be keeping in mind. So some of the examples are a wider wheelbase or more riders wanting a particular type of riding experience. I might defer to Ashley or Jake, you know, what are, what are your favorite rides? What would you like to see more of? Probably different oh. between us. That's the thing is there's so much variety. You can't really, do that like I love the flowy rides and and all that some people like the technical stuff but it's it's hard to say yeah um as a manufacturer I can tell you that uh we're pushing hard to build better and better equipment every day uh 10 years ago the equipment sucked we weren't we weren't able to do a lot of the trails, uh, but the stuff that I'm building and my competitors are building uh, is becoming more advanced. We're able to do um, more of these rides and, and more technical stuff. And so, uh, and then between the three or four of us manufacturers out there, we're pumping out bikes left and right. So there's more and more uh, folks out there with disabilities riding all these single track and double track trails. Yeah, I, and it, when it comes to trail design, I think uh, variety is key, as Ashley said, and more and more challenge is, is also key. Uh, the, the one factor, Ashley touched on this earlier, is uh, when it comes to a trail, you can have a trail that is 99.9% .9 rideable by an adaptive mountain bike. And this could be a technical trail, it could be a flowy trail, it could be a really pure single track trail. Uh, and there may be one 10 or 20 foot section that is impassable because of 
really narrow trees or some significant uh, rock feature, or the, the worst case scenario is a gate that's built, a man-made feature that could have easily been uh, altered. Uh, and that one 10, 20 foot section makes the entire, say 10 miles unrideable. Um, so that's where, when you are building trails or designing them, thinking about, um, there often are very simple solutions that don't affect the, the general ride quality uh, or even existing features, but provide some options uh, for adaptive mountain bikes to successfully ride a trail from, from start to finish. So Pat, following up on, on your answer there, there's a question on um, camber and outslope on trails. And uh, Alex Anderson asks, Off, often some slope angle is good for drainage. Do you have a recommendation on a good angle to ensure the trikes don't topple over? Uh, Jake, you might know it's more specific to the angle, uh, but it also is more trail width as well, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I have a little diagram that I drew up in AutoCAD that I'm trying to include with my manual that I'm, that I'm writing. Um, and you're right, a little bit of trail camber does help with, with drainage and, and, and whatnot. Um, like Pat said, um, if the trail was wider, then the individual can kind of choose where they want to ride on that camber and, and, and sort of negotiate that side hilling a little bit. Um, I guess, generally speaking, anywhere from, if it's more than 20 degrees, the person's gonna, gonna topple over, um, depending on the level of how good they are. Uh, but like, if it's a 20 degree angle, we're gonna topple over. Also, you could consider where that like specific point is. Like if, you know, if there's a, a big drop off on the side of it in like one portion, maybe that could have a different solution for the drainage, you know, if it becomes very dangerous, then, you know, you could kind of change it based on that. But I think most of the time when you're considering draining, it, it's not going to be that much of a slope or camber. Like it's, I think it's an easy solution. Just as a reminder, there are a couple of resources that are posted in the chat link uh, for folks that are um, asking those questions about trail forks, where to find adaptive uh, trail access, or how to post adaptive uh, mountain bike trail access if you're an admin on trail forks. So uh, be sure and check that as well. And it looks like there's also a developing park in Portland called Gateway Green. And they're using a specific rating system for a couple of trails to help out with their design process. Um, following up on equipment, there's a question from Robin Wilcox. Is there any attempt to standardize the dimension of equipment in the industry or are the different needs simply too great to make that feasible? For instance, there are pretty standard dimensions for an upright two wheel mountain bike in terms of wheelbase, turning radius and handlebar width. How can we balance not making the experience boring with the guidelines so that more trails can be inclusive from the outset? I'd say that most of these bikes are about the same size. I mean, my bikes are about 32 inches wide, uh, center to center of tires, and about, oh, you guys saw the dimensions on that last slide that Pat had. Um, most of my competitors' bikes are the same. Yeah, and touching on that, in no way at all does do adaptive mountain bikers uh, want boring trails. And I think that is sometimes a, a misconception. Technical trails, steep trails, big berms, single track, all of it's great. And, and, uh, and I think the more interesting, the better often for, uh, for any mountain biker, including adaptive mountain bikes. Um, so I think the key often when it comes to a specific design issue, I'll just hit on this topic again, often a trail can be 99.9% .9 rideable and there may just be one or two obstacles and they are not infrequently man-made obstacles uh, that could just be adjusted very simply to accommodate a bike where the rest of the riding experience doesn't change. And, uh, but all, all of the variety is great. And some of my favorite rides that take some of our athletes on are gonna be the more technical rides because it actually slows things down and uh, improves folks' riding ability, their balance, their uh, pedaling strength, everything, uh, versus just parking at the top of a hill and then and letting people fly down, so. 
So just really quickly, I do want to honor people's time. We're at 2.31. We do have one more question in the Q&A. But for those of you who do need to get off, tomorrow's webinar on rural development and financing opportunities for outdoor rec and tourism. Yeah, there's a link that's posted in that um, in the chat box. And that's happening tomorrow at 1.30 p.m. So you can check that out by the link. Um, so for, again, those of you who need to get off, um, but if we have time for one more question, um, that would be great from our, our folks here. Absolutely. Sweet. Um, from Ashley, she says, with the need for wider and more accessible trails, is ve vehicle parking an issue? Do these bikes fold down or break down to fit into cars, or is it a pickup or van that's being used to bring the bikes to the trails? Most of these folks are either uh, putting them in the back of their Subarus, in the back of their minivans. I build hitch racks that go into the back of the cars, trucks, SUVs, everything. Um, and those racks are roughly the same size as a four bike rack that you would have on the back of your car. And so we're not, we're not showing up with utility trailers or anything like that. We're showing up with the same vehicles that able-bodied cyclists uh, are using and basically the same setups. So I don't think anything would change at trailheads uh, other than possibly needing more accessible parking. That's really not my, my uh, expertise, but um, nothing's really changed in terms of vehicles or anything like that. Yeah, anytime there's a public facility, there should be an accessible parking spot. And that, that is uh, pure Americans with Disabilities Act uh, code. And we're here in Bend, fortunately, many of our trailheads do have accessible parking, the, the official one, so it works out great. Yeah. Great, it looks like that was the last question. So uh, with that, I just wanna say a huge thanks to Oregon Adaptive Sports. Uh, for Jake and Ashley joining us and um, for all of our attendees who came out. Again, our rural development opportunities and financing to support tourism uh, in recreation will be happening tomorrow at 1.30 p.m. Do look for that link in the chat um, and thanks for attending today. Thank you. Thanks everybody.